friend one, father to son, not my son. He realizes now what he had never thought to notice before. All the other apprentices were indeed sons of the potters. It's not my fault, Tree Ear wanted to shout. He wanted to run all the way back to Min and scream the words. It's not my fault you lost your son, not my fault that I am an orphan. Why must it be father to son? If the pot is made well, does it matter whose son made it? Crane Man hailed him cheerfully from under the bridge with the news that two pairs of sandals were complete. Tree Ear feigned eagerness as he tried them on, but he knew that Crane Man had read his troubled face at once. Train man said nothing, only waited. Tree Ear tied the sandals together carefully in pairs. As he hung them up in a safe place under the bridge, he said, The potter's trade passes from father to son here in Chuopo. Is it thus everywhere? A story tells the answer to that, Crane Man replied. He hobbled over to a large rock and sat down. Tree Ear knelt beside him. Potters have not always been considered artists, you know. In the long ago days when potters made objects for use and not beauty, it was considered a poor trade indeed. None wished for their sons to have such a lowly life. Year after year, more sons left the trade until at last there were not enough potters to supply the needs of the people. So the king of the time decreed that sons of potters must become potters themselves. Tree Ear shook his head and even managed a grim smile. Imagine, sons running away from what he wished most to do. I do not know if it is still a law, Crane Man con continued, but a well-kept condition, tradition can be stronger than law. Tree Ear nodded. At least he knew now that it would be useless to leave Chuopo in search of another master. Crane Man stood and leaned on his crutch to stretch out his good leg. He glanced sideways at Tree Ear. My friend, the same wind that blows one door shut often blows another open, he said. Tree Ear stood too and went to fetch the supper bowl. It sometimes took him a while to figure out Crane Man's riddles, but he preferred puzzling over them to be told them to being told what they meant. Work no longer felt the same to Tree Ear. He now realized that he had been working all along toward the goal of being allowed to make a pot. With that hope gone, so went his eagerness to work. More than ever, he wished that he had not been so rash as to offer to take Min's vessel to Songdo. He would do it, not for the old potter, he thought bitterly, but for Ajima. Tree Ear checked the clay at the draining site. Some of the clay balls were drying out too quickly. He dampened the cloth that covered them. Then, using a wooden blade, he scored the surface of the clay in the drainage bed so it would dry faster. How much slower the work went when the joy of it was gone. The clay in the bed was coming along well. It would be ready to form into balls soon. Tree Ear took a handful of clay from the corner of the bed and kneaded it. Absent-mindedly, he began to form a petal shape. After so many attempts at making the petal that was eventually used for the water pot, his hands seemed to work on their own accord, flattening here, pinching there. Tree Ear's hands paused in mid-motion. Slowly, he brought the half-formed petal up to eye level and examined it closely. Molding he thought. There was more than one way to make a piece of pottery, throwing, of course, using the wheel to assist in shaping a symmetrical piece, but the little animals atop the incense burners, the handles of some vessels, the water droppers, they were not thrown, they were molded by hand without any aid from the wheel. For the first time in days, Tree Ear grinned as he crushed the pedal back into a fistful of clay. The second door had just blown open. As usual, Min's work took far longer than he had predicted, and summer was merging with fall before the pieces were ready. A dozen replicas had been fired in three separate batches, and the last firing yielded a pair of superb vases. Their delicate floral inlay work shone against the perfect glazed background. Under Min's instruction, Tree Ear built a special jigay to wear on his back. As they worked, Min grumbled about the problem of transporting the vases, speaking more to himself than to Tree Ear. Ajima came out to the yard with tea. She served them while Min continued his muttering. A straw container, Ajima suggested, such as those used to carry rice, only perhaps double thickness, lined with more straw and silk. The vases would be well protected. Min sipped his tea, then turned to Tree Ear. Do you know of one who could make such a container? So it was that that Crane Man, too, came to work for Min. He and Min agreed on a price for the laborer, and the Crane Man began to weave the container under the eaves of Min's house. Tree Ear would be leaving in a few days. The straw container had been completed, sturdy with double walls and an attached lid. It was exactly the size to take the vases and padding, and padding tightly packed. Crane Man fussed about his creation, making invisible adjustments to the straw. Najima came out to see it. She and Tree Ear exchanged amused glances behind Crane Man's back. Is it finished? Ajima asked. Crane Man stopped his poking and pinched and bowed to Ajima. It was an honor to be a part of this endeavor. Crane Man stood aside while Ajima lifted the lid of the container and closed it again, fastening it with a straw bobble and braided loop. Fine work, she said, nodding in quiet admiration. Then she turned to Crane Man, her brow furrowed. Crane
Crane Man, she said. I have a favor to ask of you. The Crane Man stood up proudly on his one leg. Nothing that the Honorable Potter's wife could ask would be too much, he answered. Ajima bowed in return. She glanced at Trier and gestured at him with one hand. This one. I have grown accustomed to his assistance, she said. A hundred little chores he does for me each day. It is a great help to me in my old age. Now it was Trier's turn about, which he did in bafflement. What was in Ajima's mind? I would be most grateful, Crane Man, if you could come to the house and continue this work while Tree Ear is away, she said. Then she hung her head a little and wrung her hands as if ashamed. I could not pay you. I hope that perhaps my thanks in the form of a meal. Tree Ear felt an enormous wave of relief wash over him, but caught himself in time to show no emotion. It would not do to embarrass Crane Man. It had been his greatest worry how Crane Man would eat while he was away. Of course, his friend could always go back to rifling rubbish heaps and foraging in the woods, but Tree Ear had felt it would be like abandoning him for Crane Man to go back to such scavenging. For days now, he had been worrying over the problem, and Ajima had offered the answer unma unasked. Your offer of food is kindness itself, Crane Man said. Tree Ear looked up in alarm. This was the phrase of polite refusal. What was Crane Man doing? I would be happy to come by from time to time, he continued. Ajima nodded soberly. Crane Man bent over and picked up the crutch that then bowed in farewell to her. I will see you back at the bridge, Tree Ear, he said and hopped away. Tree Ear watched until Crane Man disappeared beyond the bend in the road, then turned to Ajima, a question in his eyes. Because he is proud, Tree Ear, she said, he does not wish to be fed out of pity. Tree Ear kicked a small stone at his feet. Why was it that pride and foolishness were often so close companions? Arms crossed and stance defiant, Trier stood under the bridge and began to speak. I have a journey to make, he said sternly, over a road unknown to me. A thousand things could go wrong. Do you not think I have enough to worry about? Crane Man looked up in surprise. Trier had never before spoken to him in such anger. Are you thinking of me, my friend? Do not worry. I fed myself and you, for that matter, for many years before you worked for men. I can do so again. Do you think me so helpless now? Not you, Trier shouted, flapping his arms in frustration like a giant bird. I am not talking of you. It is Min's wife I am thinking of. She is an old woman now. Would you have her poor back ache from pulling weeds and those long walks in the mountains for mushrooms or berries? She should long ago have earned rest from such tasks. From her husband, she gets no help at all. He thinks of nothing but his work. Treer paused, his breath coming in gasps. He inhaled once deeply, then spoke more quietly. Would you have me worry about her on my journey, friend? Why will you not help her? For in helping her, you would be helping me. The shock ebbed from Crane Man's eyes now that Tree Ear was no longer shouting. He turned to face the river, then back his back to Tree Ear. Tree Ear watched and waited. Crane Man's bad leg was shaking a little. In a moment, it shook harder. Now Crane Man's whole body was trembling. Tree Ear stepped forward in concern. He had not meant to make his friend cry. Tree Ear touched Crane Man on the shoulder. Crane Man waved one arm at him, still shaking, but he was not crying. He was laughing. The silent laughter had been he had been suppressing burst out of him, and he laughed so hard that he dropped his crutch. Trier picked it up and stood in silence, first puzzled, then annoyed when Crane Man's laughter showed no sign of stopping. If there was a joke, he had missed it. Hey, my friend, Crane Man said at last and drew in a long breath. A few last chuckles escaped him as he took the crutch from Trier and leaned on it to sit on the ground. He looked up and jabbed the crutch at Trier. A fine performance, he exclaimed. I have never seen better. Tree Ear's mouth dropped open for an instant, but he recovered quickly. What do you mean performance? He demanded. You would question my sincerity? No, little monkey. That I would never doubt. He smiled, obviously still amused. If it means so much to you, I will go daily to the house of men. There. Does that satisfy you? Tree Ear nodded grudgingly. The matter was settled, for he knew that Crane Man would keep his word. Tree Ear's speech had gained the desired result, although not exactly in the way that he had planned. Two vases, not the ones chosen, were packed in the straw container as a test. They had been stuffed with silk and wrapped in more silk. Rice, straws was, rice straw was layered between them and crammed into every pocket of space. Min, Ajima, and Crane Man all watched as Tree Ear picked up the container and hurled it with all his strength to the ground. Then he rolled it over and over and even kicked it a few times. Min rushed forward and unhooked the straw bobble. He groped inside. Then nodded at once in satisfaction. The bases were unbroken. Unpack it, he ordered. Tree Ear then went inside to fetch the two selected vessels. As soon as Min had left the yard, Crane Man stepped forward to examine the container. 
He too was satisfied. The woven straw had sustained no damage. Repacked with its precious cargo, the container was lashed to the jagay. A sleeping mat was rolled tightly to, and tied to the bottom of the frame. On one side hung two pairs of sandals, on the other a small gourd water dipper and a bag to be filled with rice cakes. The jagay was ready. Tree ear would leave in the morning. Tree ear and gray man skipped stones under the bridge in the twilight. Before the light was gone, Tree ear reached into his waist pouch and slowly withdrew a small object. He handed it to Crane Man. A gift, Tree Ear said, to remind you of your promise to go daily to the House of Men. He did not want to say to remind you of me. Over the past month or so, Tree Ear had, been, had filled his idle time by molding clay. He kept a small ball in his waist pouch and experimented with it whenever he had the chance. After some time, a shape began to form out of the clay. It was almost as if the clay was speaking to him, telling him what it wished to become. A monkey, similar to a water dropper men had once made smaller than the palm of Tree Ear's hand. The monkey sat with his hands clasped, clasped before its round belly, looking content and well-fed. Tree Ear had inlaid two tiny spots for eyes and inscribed other details on his face, hands, and fur. During the preparation for the final firing of the kiln, he had secreted the little monkey in a corner and managed to retrieve it afterward without men's notice. To Tree Ear's delight, it shared with the other vessels of that firing the fine green gray green glaze. Tree Ear had concluded the molding was not at all the same as throwing a pot on the wheel. Molding lacked the same sense of wonder, and of course no perfect symmetrical vessel could be made without the wheel. There were still t still times when the vision of the prunus vase had once he had once dreamed of make making appeared in his mind's eye, as if mocking him. In spite of this, Tree Ear found that he enjoyed the incision work. He had spent hours on the details of the monkey's features, inscribing them with progressively finer points. This, at least, was the same process, whether on a molded figure or a thrown pot. On seeing the monkey after it had been fired, Tree Ear felt a quiet thrill. The monkey was hollow, like all the water droppers men made. But as Crane Man had no need for such of a thing, Tree Ear had not added the water holes. It was simply a little figure, almost like a toy. Crane Man examined the gift closely. He turned it over and around and stroked its smooth finish. He started to speak, but the sound of his voice was rusty, and he shook his head instead. He hobbled over to the basket where he kept his odds and ends, and brought forth a piece of twine. Still silent, he fixed the twine cleverly around the monkey, tied a firm knot, and slipped the loop around his belt. The monkey swung gaily at his waist. At last he spoke. I am honored to wear it, he said, and bowed. The honor is mine, Tree Ear responded. The crane man looked down and played with the monkey in his fingers. I have no gift for you, beyond words, he said. I would tell you this. Of all the problems you may meet on your journey, it will be people who are the greatest danger, but it will also be people to whom you must turn if ever you are in need of aid. Remember this, my friend, and you will travel well. And that was the end of chapter nine.